Welcome back to another video I'm sorry that you haven't seen anything from me in a little while Life caught up with me a little bit and I didn't have the opportunity to film Here I am. And I hope that you will enjoy tonight's video. It is partly for me and partly for you. I am currently doing a block in my studies. A block is a couple of weeks doing a particular subject or specialty in medicine. And the current block is orthopedics. So that's all about And I personally have not looked at the bones in at least a year, possibly two. So it would do me well to have a look at the bones and I hope that you either find it interesting and informative or very, very boring and sleepy. So I have this box of flashcards. It's very cool. Inside is a collection of flashcards that are organized according to region of the body. And I have already removed the ones about bones. So these remaining cards are all about other an anatomical structures like muscles and, you know, organs, nerves, etc. If anybody happens to like this content, then I will go ahead and make more videos for the other anatomical structures because bones can be quite boring. But we'll see about that. Okay. this little pointer and I'm just going to start going through the bones. Please note that I may have to cheat a lot. I may have to look at 
the opposite side of the card which has the information because I will probably not remember all of the names of the different structures and that is why this is as much a video for me as it is for you because it will be some much needed revision okay so this is the skull the anterior view of the skull number one is pointing to the frontal bone number two points to the supraorbital foramen and it's easy to remember because this is the orbit and so you have a supraorbital and infraorbital foramen that's number six through which nerves and blood vessels can pass from the inside of the skull to supply the skin and other structures on the outside of the skull number three points to the nasal bone in orange number four points to the lacrimal bone Number five is the zygomatic bone, and this is the cheekbone. Number seven points to the maxilla, and number eight points to the mental foramen on the mandible, which is a number nine. Okay, so the colors of the bones will remain the same in the next image, and then we can compare the two views. So, here's the mandible again. There's the maxilla again. It has a top portion and an alveolar portion that connects to the teeth. This is the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone. This is a new bone which was not marked. And this is the temporal bone. And it connects to the zygomatic bone via the zygomatic process, so that is quite easy to remember. This is the external acoustic meatus. That is basically where your ear goes, your ear canal. That is the passage for sound. This is another new bone. This is the occipital bone with the lamboid suture. So the spaces between the skull bones are sutures and this is the lamboid suture while this is the coronal suture. This is the parietal bone the nasal bone as we said, the frontal bone, and this yellow, I mean, what, what are colors? This pink bone, I believe, is the lac, it's not the lacrimal bone. Let's see. Oh, it is. Okay, it is. That 
is the lacrimal bone again, so that is this bone. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And then this yellow bone, which you can see over here, that is the sphenoid bone. Okay, so if we cut the person in half, we can see inside the skull there are some spaces known as sinuses. One resides in the sphenoid bone and that would be the sphenoid sinus. Here we can see the parietal bone, that's such a lie, the palatine bone, sorry, what a slip of the tongue. It's just this little, little section. This section, something with the V, let's see. That section is the vomer, vomer. It is also worth noting that some of these words I have never seen, well, I have only seen them written and I have never heard them being pronounced, so my pronunciation is really up to me and might not be correct. So, the vomer, and above the vomer we have the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone is also home to a sinus, which cannot be seen right now, but there are ethmoid sinuses as well. And here we have another sinus in the frontal bone, called the frontal sinus. So here we can see the maxilla, and the palatine bone here at the back. These are nasal conchae, they are within the nasal cavity, and they do things, I think they move the air around and possibly humidify it. Don't, I don't recall exactly what they do, but they are definitely important. So the nasal conchae, this is the sphenoid bone with the sphenoid sinus, and the frontal bone with the frontal sinus, and this is all cartilage. This is the alar cartilage. The nasal bone. So, the reason why you always see skulls with no nose is because this is all cartilage and so it is not preserved in the same way that bone is preserved. Back here, I believe this is the lacrimal bone. Let's check. Yes, it is. Okay. So, this is from the bottom. The occipital bone with the foramen magnum. This is the condyle, the articular surface that articulates with the first vertebra. So, this is how the skull connects to the spine. Here is the temporal bone, the external acoustic meatus zygomatic process, zygomatic bone, maxilla, palatine bone, there we go, the vomer again, and the ethmoid bone will be somewhere inside then this is the sphenoid bone, and that's that. Okay, so 
So this is showing you all of the holes in the skull through which the nerves travel, the 12 cranial nerves. I don't know if you remember, there is another anatomy video on the channel that talks about the cranial nerves. So you can check that out if you are interested. But basically, they all pass through these holes from the inside to the outside. So, this is the cruciform plate for the first nerve for smell. And the cruciform plate is actually behind the structure at the top of the nasal cavity you have the cribriform plate and that is how particles that transmit smell are recognized okay then we have the optic canal for sight this is the superior orbital fissure and a lot of nerves pass through there many of them to do with eye movements I'm going to need help from this point onwards let's see so number four, five, six, seven okay. so this is foramen rotundum ovale these two are for cranial nerve 5 the tiny one here, tiny tiny, number 6, tiny is for, is the foramen spinosum number 7 is foramen lacerum number 8 is for the internal jugular vein I believe I think it's called the in, oh no my apologies, it's carotid. It's the carotid canal, that's number eight. Carotid canal for the carotid. Number nine is the internal acoustic meatus. So the other end of that hole in the temporal bone. This is the jugular foramen, the largest one. Then you have the hypoglossal canal for nerve 12 and the foramen magnum. Okay. So this is the mandible. Here you have the condyle of the mandible, the head and neck, which will articulate with the rest of the skull. Then you have, I believe it's a carnoid process. Let's check. It is. So this is a carnoid process. As you go down, you have your mylohyoid line. And below that, number three is pointing to the submandibular fossa. Some of the terminology makes it easier to understand what you're looking at because a fossa means a kind of a indentation, kind of like this. It just goes in, but it's not a hole. So that's the sub below the mandible, submandibular fossa. Then we have the mental foramen, the mental protuberance, the chin, and this is the body and the ramus of the mandible. This is the ramus, this is the body. Okay. So this is looking from the back. Again, we have the condyle, 
the ramus, the body, submandibular fossa. I forget the names of these structures. Let's check. Okay, so number two is the lingula. Then we have the mandibular foramen and the mylohyoid groove. Sublingual fossa. So, these are known as mental spines. Tiny little tiny little, I don't know what you would call that I really don't know what you would call that a tiny protuberance <laughs> a tiny hill that's a mental spine number six is the sublingual fossa so sublingual is underneath the tongue sublingual fossa the mylohyoid groove oh I see I'm messing up this is the mylohyoid groove this is the submandibular fossa as we saw earlier and this is the mandibular foramen I believe exactly and that's the lingula. Okay, so this one is a bit tricky. And also, you know, is it really that relevant what these tiny structures are? I guess it depends what line of work you're in. But to recap, we've got the condyla process, the mandibular foramen, little, little lingula coming out. Mylohyoid groove, submandibular fossa, sublingular fossa, and mental spines. Okay. So that is it for the skull itself. There are a lot of bones in the skull. Let's move on to the spine. So the first spine bone, the first vertebra, is called the atlas and it rotates on the second vertebra which is called the axis. So the atlas is the only one that does not have a spinous process. It just has a little, a little thing. So I don't know why, but they turn these around. So this is the superior view, looking from the top. And at this point, this is the front. So this is the anterior tubercle. But now, when you look at it in this picture from the bottom, this is the front. Oh, I suppose that does make sense. Oh, that does make sense. Okay, so this is the front. So you have your anterior tubercle, transverse process with your transverse foramen. These are the articular facets. These are the top ones which are going to articulate with the occipital condyles, if you remember. The little bumps at the bottom of the spine. They will fit snugly into these spaces. Then you have, I believe this is the pedicle, but I don't want to lie. It might just be called hmm, an anterior arch. A 
that's called the anterior arch of the atlas. In the axis, you have the pedicle. So the pedicle connects the transverse process to the body of the vertebra. On the axis, you have the dens. This is the dens on the body of the vertebra, which fits into the atlas. So it will stick out. And these particular facets will connect to these at the bottom of the atlas. Transverse processes with transverse foramina and a spinous process. Okay. So the ligaments in the spine are quite important for my current purposes, so I'm going to revise them. But there won't be a lot of ligaments in this video. So the ones on the side are the capsules for these joints. So on the end of the vertebra, there is the articular facet, right? This guy. And this articular facet connects to the articular facet of another vertebra. And so where two bones connect, it's a joint. And so these are joint capsules on the side. This is the, I think it's an occipital atlanto or atlanto occipital membrane. Let's see. Okay, it is. So this is the posterior atlanto occipital membrane. These are the capsules of the atlanto occipital joint and the atlanto axial joint. This is the ligamentum flavum, and the ligamentum flavum runs down here. So to orient you, orient, orient, orientate, to orientate you, that doesn't sound right either. Oh well. This is the front, and this is the back. So. This is the anterior longitudinal ligament. These are the vertebral bodies, so that would be the front part. Then you have the hole, this hole, this hole. And that is the hole through which the spinal cord passes through. Just behind the body, before you get to the hole, you have a posterior longitudinal ligament. On the other side of the hole, you have the ligamentum flavum. And then you have your spinous processes. Okay. This, I believe, let's see what that is called. That is the ligamentum nuque and the artery that passes passes through here is the vertebral artery and that is it for that one so here is the skull the base of the skull, the first and second third vertebra. So these are the joints. This is the, I want to say the posterior longitudinal ligament because 
This is the hole through which the spinal cord passes. So, the vertebral body, the round part, is on the other side of this ligament. And so, this is hugging the posterior part of the vertebral body. And over here, you would have a spinous process coming down. So, between the occiput and C1 and C2, you have a cruciate ligament, which is made up of a transverse ligament and a superior and inferior longitudinal ligament. And then you have some other ligaments, which are called alar ligaments. So these are the alar ligaments over there. I believe that they attach to the dens, but I'm not sure. And these are all covered by the tectorial membrane, which is continuous with the posterior longitudinal ligament. Okay, so you have seven cervical vertebra, twelve thoracic and five lumbar, and then a sacrum and a coccyx. Let's look at them in more detail. So, this is the body, the transverse process and transverse foramen, the vertebral foramen, the pedicle connects the body to the transverse foramen and the lamina connects the transverse foramen to the spinous process. Here are the spinous processes. There's the dense. So the first cervical membrane would sit on top. So the first, what did I just say? I said a membrane, didn't I? The first cervical vertebra would sit on top of this one. So this is two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you can see that the first thoracic vertebra, T1, it's different, it doesn't have the same transverse processes. So let's get into that. The thoracic vertebra have articular surfaces for the ribs to connect to them. So there are 12 thoracic vertebra for 12 ribs. And so the ribs would connect here. This articular surface connects to this articular surface of the vertebra above. So a vertebra below this one would have its little ears peak right in here, and that is how they would connect. So there is the pedicle and the lamina connecting the body transverse process and spinous process, but note that there are no foramina in the thoracic vertebra. Next we have a lumbar vertebra, same general makeup, body pedicle, vertebral foramen, transverse process, lamina spinous process and an articular surface to connect to the next vertebra. B1 
between the vertebra we have intervertebral discs which are made up of an annular outside layer and an internal nucleus and these are cartilaginous discs so intervertebral disc body transverse process spinous process this is the articular the inferior articular surface so each of these holes is known as a vertebral and intervertebral foramen I believe let's see yes an intervertebral foramen between two vertebra with a superior and an inferior vertebral notch so five is a superior and seven is an inferior vertebral notch with an intervertebral foramen between so once you get the general terminology it's quite easy to remember the different structures here is a revision of the ligaments anterior longitudinal body intervertebral disc posterior longitudinal ligament here is where the canal would pass ligamentum flavum interspinous ligaments and supraspinous ligament and here is the joint perfect so let's take a quick look at the sacrum and the coccyx so here is where the sacrum articulates with the lumbar vertebra this is where the two the two articular processes would connect here at the back and here is where the body would sit okay so here we have anterior sacral foramina and at the back posterior sacral foramina we have a sacral hiatus and sacral horns and then a coccyx this is some kind of ridge let's see so it's the median sacral crest and this is the auricular articular surface so this articular surface is going to connect to the ilium of the hip of the pelvis which you will see in a second so this is the middle part of the pelvis it articulates with the spine and with the rest of the pelvis over here this is the alar the ala of the sacrum the wings of the sacrum all right so here you can see that the sides the auricular articular surfaces connect to the ilium on each side so this is an ilium this is an ischium and this is a pubis so the iliac crest anterior superior and anterior inferior iliac spines the pubic ramus ischial spine with a greater and lesser sciatic notch and then here is your alecranon 
That is such a lie. <laughs> Sometimes random words will come out of my mouth because they're somewhere in my brain and they sound similar to what I'm looking for but they really are not the same. This is the acetabulum. And that is why, on another note, for some reason unbeknownst to me, they love having oral exams. We haven't had them so much because of COVID, but before COVID, they would have them a lot more. And they just stress me out so much because you don't really have time to think because somebody is staring you down and that is when the gibberish, the gibberish comes out and I hit blanks and all of that stuff. And that is not my preferred way to be assessed. But to be fair, I just hate assessments in general, so it was never going to be lovely, you know. Anyway. This is the acetabulum, the, the socket of the hip joint where the femur pops in. Okay. So we still have quite a few. Hmm, I think I could get through all of them. I I've got quite a bit of stamina, so let's see. This is the humerus and the scapula of the shoulder. The shoulder and the arm. So the scapula and the inferior angle, superior angle, and here is the glenoid cavity for the head of the humerus to fit in. It doesn't really fit inside, but there's a hole. This is the acromion and the coronoid process. There is a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle, and I think this is an intertuberculous sulcus, but let's see what they say. So they agree. An intertuberculous sulcus. A sulcus is basically a groove, so that you can see there. And then you have the capitulum, so this is the front view, the capitulum, the medial and lateral epicondyles and what is that? That would be hmm what number was it? It was number seven the coronoid fossa so they sound similar and they're in the similar region but this is a coronoid fossa and this is a coracoid process. So from the back, the head of the humerus fitting into the glenoid cavity. This is the greater tubercle that you can still see. This is the deltoid, deltoid process, deltoid tuberosity. It's where the deltoid muscle will connect, will attach. 
much. Then we have the olecranon fossa at the back and the trochlea. And again, the lateral and medial epicondyles. You have the scapula with the superior and inferior angle. And the scapula has a spine. The spine is continuous with the acromion, which connects to the clavicle. This is a supraclavicular notch, a supraspinous fossa, and an infraspinous fossa. Let's just double check that information. Yes, it's a deltoid tuberosity. So again, this is the elbow. From the front, we had the coronoid, coronoid fossa. The capitulum, this is the radius and the ulna. The radius and ulna both have a tuberosity, a radial and ulnar tuberosity that are landmarks. And from the back, here is the olecranon of the ulna fitting into the olecranon fossa of the humerus. The epicondyles and the radius. This is the head and neck of the radius. So the radius does not really articulate as closely with the humerus as the ulna does. And so here you can see again that the ulna kind of gets in the way. The olecranon and then the radius. There's the radius. There's the ulna. And on this image you can see that the ulna stays steady at all times, connected to the humerus, and the radius flips over, flips over the ulna to allow your arm to go from this position to this position without moving your upper arm at all and that is called supination and pronation so this is supination you are receiving soup receiving soup and this is pronation you are pouring pouring soup pouring soup supination Okay, and then the wrist and hand are full of tiny, tiny bones. These are all phalanges from here. So distal, middle, and that's a lie, proximal, middle, and distal phalanges and these are the metacarpal bones so the thumb only has two the thumb doesn't have a middle phalange the metacarpal bones and then these tiny bones so you have your scaphoid I believe trapezius. I'm going to need help with this one. Okay, so scaphoid, trapezium, trapezioid. Capitate, scaphoid, trapezium, trapezioid. Oh, this entire thing is the scaphoid. Okay. Sca
scaphoid, trapezium, trapezoid. This bone would be the lunate. This one would be okay, so this one, <laughs> this one would be the capitate, this one would be the lunate, and then 10 and 11 are a hamate and a pisiform. Hamate and pisiform, and there's a tiny one over there. Tiny, 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 called the triquetrum. Oh my goodness, okay. So I'm not going to remember this, but let's try. Scaphoid, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, lunate, something, <laughs> pisiform. Oh yes, this is a hamate, isn't it? Hamate. Form and then a triquetrum. <laughs> Once again, the pronunciation is not is not clear, but okay. We got it. We got it. We got it. So this is the ilium, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis, as I showed you before. This is the hip and the pelvis. So, you have your iliac crest. This is the front and this is the back of the body. So this would be the posterior, superior and inferior iliac spines. Then a greater sciatic notch, lesser sciatic notch, and an ischial spine. Here, there's an ischial tuberosity. Here they have we have the pubis. So number seven, I'll have to check. And then this is the acetabula. Let's check out number seven. So that would be the pubic tubercle. Okay. So this is the pubic tubercle. So this is looking at it from this direction, from inside. So the pubic tubercle was on that side, and here, this is where the pubic symphysis comes together. I think this is the ischial ramus. Yes, the ramus of the ischium. We have your ischial tuberosity on the other side lesser and greater sciatic notch. This is your iliac tubercle. This is an articular facet which connects to the sacrum. The iliac crest, the anterior, superior and inferior iliac spine. So this is the hip joint, around the joint itself you have something called like a, a what is it called, a labrum, that's what it's called, so a labrum, an acetabular labrum, down below there's a transverse ligament. And so this entire hole in the bone is just kind of enclosed by ligaments so that it's nice and stable. This is the ligament of the head of the femur which is cut in this image but these two parts would be connected and then you have the articular cartilage on the head of the femur so that it can fit snugly in the hole 
and be cushioned and not cause any pain or disruption. So, since we know the names of the structures on the hip, on the pelvis, we can kind of rationalize the names of these ligaments. So if this is the ilium, anterior, superior and inferior iliac spines, then this would be the iliofemoral ligament, and this would be the pubofemoral ligament, as this is the pubis. Then down here, this is the ischium, with the ischial tuberosity, so this would be the ischiofemoral ligament, and this would be the iliofemoral ligament. So this is the femur. From the front, you have the head of the femur, the greater and lesser trochanter, with an intertrochanteric line, the shaft, the lateral and medial condyles, and the epicondyles, and then you have a ridge on the back, which is called the linea aspera, linea aspera. So there's the two trochanters with an intertrochanteric crest on the back. Intertrochanteric crest and intertrochanteric line. This is the head and the neck of the femur. The femur connects to the tibia. So this is the articular surfaces for that. And both the tibia and fibula make up the ankle at the bottom. So here you have the... just want to check... Yeah, that's all they say. So they say medial malleolus and lateral malleolus. So the malleolus is the ankle bone that you can feel. So this is the little part of your ankle that sticks out on the inside of your foot, on the, the middle, the medial part of your foot. And this is the other little sticking out piece. So the fibula and tibia, there's a tibial tuberosity and condyles, I believe, is the terminology for the tibia as well. Yes, the lateral and medial condyles and that is all, tibial tuberosity. Okay. So we have two flashcards left, if you are still here. This is the knee joint, so this is the femur attaching to the tibia, with the tibial tuberosity. And you can feel this on your tibia, possibly, um, as well. It kind of sticks out, just underneath your knee. So this is the fibular longitudinal ligament and the tibia, I want to say, but let's check. So you have a fibular collateral, 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 collateral ligament and a tibial collateral ligament. Okay, so a fibular and tibial collateral ligament transverse ligament and a lateral and medial meniscus. The meniscus is a piece of cartilage that sits between the two condyles so that the bones are not touching. 
Then you have your anterior cruciate ligament, which many people know as an ACL. The ACL is commonly torn um, in sports injuries. And then you have the posterior cruciate ligament. Okay, so that's the joint. And lastly, the foot. So, kind of similar to the hands, you have metatarsal bones and phalanges. And then these bones are the talus and the calcaneus. So the calcaneus is the heel of the foot. Then you have, hmm, let's check, I don't want to lie. So the navicular and the cuneiform and sesamoid. So this is the navicular bone, which comes over onto the lateral onto the middle of the foot, my apologies. So this is looking at it from the side, and this is looking at it from the middle. So the navicular goes into the middle, and then you have your cuneiform, cuneiform bones, and this bone, we didn't check, that would be the cuboid, cuboid bone. And there's a little sesamoid bone. Okay, so to recap, metatarsals and phalanges, calcaneus and talus, navicular, cuboid, and cuneiform, two cuneiform bones, and then a little sesamoid bone. So those are basically all of the bones in the body, minus a few, and I hope that you found it wonderfully boring and that it relaxed you. I really, really benefited from the revision of the terminology and just looking at what everything looks like. Again, you know, it's always helpful, so I am very appreciative of the opportunity to film tonight. In the last portion of the video, my refrigerator turned on and it is very loud. But it also kind of sounds like rain sometimes, so I'm going to see in editing whether it is unbearable or whether it has created some nice white noise because I love a little bit of white noise in ASMR. So we shall see. But I hope that you have a beautiful, beautiful night. And I will see you again soon. Bye bye.